This might be a silly question, um, but have you ever, I mean, I mean, being in DC, you've probably interacted or at least seen some high level leaders in the world, high level politicians, high level people running different countries. Have you ever met and spent time with a king, an actual king, anybody? Okay, well, one person, uh, show off over there. Um, I'll add to that because I have two. I would like uh, to tell you the time I not only uh, spent time with one, I actually played top golf with one. Top golf fans, anybody? Okay, no, moving on. Um, yes, this is the time, I need to use the air quotes here because uh, played would be a very big exaggeration, but the time I was at top golf at the same time as King James, LeBron James. This is not the time for the debate of Jordan versus James because there really is no debate. It always has, it always will be Michael Jordan. But anyway, I had a friend, uh, this is not a name drop, you'll hear, you'll understand. I had a friend that worked for the Cavs and so he invited me when they were in Atlanta uh, to Top Golf, and apparently it was organized by some people on the team. And so when we showed up, I was not fully surprised that there was LeBron James in the flesh, two bays down for me, sitting on a couch. And, and again, I'm like, I hope he's okay not freaking out that Brad Jones is here. I'm like, it was just like, bro, keep your phone. I need some space. I'm a real human. I'm just here to enjoy Top Golf. Like, ease off, bro. No, it's like, okay, LeBron James is at Top Golf right there. And so that completely changed my experience of the night. And I'm like the whole time wondering, uh, are, am I gonna meet him? I'm not, never gonna ask for a picture, but am I gonna talk to him? Are we gonna, am I gonna play in his bay? I, I didn't, I was like three bays over and I just, every swing, I'm like, did LeBron see it? Did LeBron see it? Like, how did, how did he feel about it? You know, like, is he swinging the, the whole night? And I'm like, and I'm wondering about my interaction. Am I gonna, uh, you know, is there with, you know, the, the organization, am I gonna meet the king? Am I gonna interact with him? Well, all that to say, I met him for like five seconds. It was like, hey, I'm Brad. Hey, I'm LeBron. I'm like, duh. Okay, good to meet you. I went on. That was my very limited interaction with a king. And, and as we go to Matthew chapter six in the central portion of Jesus's teaching about the way in the kingdom, we're gonna talk about are how you and I have this amazing invitation, this amazing privilege, this amazing opportunity to interact not with the people of the kingdom, but with the king himself. And sadly, I think we all fail to maximize that opportunity. I never got to go sit by LeBron. That was kind of hoping that I would go from his bay, my bay to his bay sitting on the couch. But you and I have been invited to sit with the king. Are we taking, are you taking up him up on that offer? And I know maybe some of you have heard many messages on prayer or you just think, okay, um, yeah, prayer, that's what we're supposed to do. That, that is where we're going. But I feel like so many Christians, including the guy standing on the stage, have such, has such a limited perspective of this beautiful invitation that we're missing out on so much of the beauty of this, this relationship that we have with God. So let's go um, to Matthew chapter six, verse one. It says, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you, will, if you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So Jesus changes gears from talking about how we're, you know, all the different things that you've been talking about, how we're treating each other in this kingdom, how we're living our lives. Then he said, beware, be careful, guard yourself from practicing righteousness in order to be seen by others. And he's, he's about to talk about three things, giving to the needy, prayer, and fasting. Three things that this would be conduct that people would do in the time to honor God. It would be as they would see religious activity. And he said, hey, watch out for the motivation behind your action." Think about as you give to the needy. He didn't say don't give to the needy. Think about as you pray. He did not say don't pray. Think about as you fast. He didn't say don't fast. 
He said, just make sure you're doing those things for the right reasons. When I say prayer, when I say giving, when I say fasting, I'm gonna let Ben talk about that later because I'm no expert because there's a bunch of milk bar, uh, little cookie cakes in my hotel room last night and I couldn't even avoid those. So, right. But when I say those three things, you're like, I, I would imagine most of you are like, that's what we gotta do. Yeah, that's what we're supposed to do. That's what we have to do. It is an obligation. It is a duty. It is a responsibility. And we are missing, like Jesus said, we're missing the reward of practicing this righteousness. And, and God's wanting to t give you, a, a, you know, just like any car, you gotta go and get the oil changed. You gotta go get the brakes checked out. I believe today's message, I hope today's message is a tune up, not just for you, but for me because we're missing out on this beautiful thing called communion with our king. He said, beware that you won't do things in order to be seen. If you do, you will have no reward in heaven. Verse two, so when, again, key word, when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So he starts with giving to the needy, not if and how and how much. He said, why would you give, why are you giving to the needy? Some commentators at some point thought maybe when the big gifts came in, when, when it was giving, that they would like blow the trumpets. You know, I can't imagine us doing that. But I can't imagine, because I've done it, like if I, if I do something nice for somebody, don't judge me, Ben. Uh, if, I, if I give a little bit, I'll just maybe casually try to bring it up in conversation. I'll just, uh, you know, like casually just try to make you know that I did something good for something else. You know, might not gram about it, but I'm gonna at least ask a lead-in question. So you'll ask me, oh, did you do, oh yeah, yeah, I was helping some guy the other day, just changed his tire on the side of the road. No big deal, I'm a saint, I love Jesus, just always helping people. Or maybe uh, going back to giving, remember pre-COVID when you would go to churches or our church and we had passed the buckets? It's kind of a thing of the past, I guess. Is it coming back? I don't know. But um, if, we, if you wanna get noticed, which I think we all at some point do, when you pass the buckets and you're given a big gift, maybe it's not you, maybe it's me, but if I'm given a gift, that bucket comes to me, I'm gonna slow it down so people can see me pull out my wallet. And I, if I'm given a check that has a few digits on it, I'm gonna leave that check face up, you know? Fellas, this might be a good tool for you to get the ladies to notice you. Write a big check, put it in there. She sees it, it's like, whoa, maybe I will go to dinner with you. <laughs> if you're not giving, you're like, pass that thing quick. But, but you and I, we're, we're, we, we do things to be seen. This is what Jesus saw. He saw a lot of religious activity. He's speaking to a Jewish people that had been following God by tradition, very active, doing a lot of things for God but not from the right place. And as I look at that passage, I gotta do a heart check. I gotta think about why I'm doing what I'm doing. Again, thank you for the very kind introduction, Ben. You did make it sound like I was very old. You're like, this guy's been around passion for a long time. And I was like, yeah. Um, and I don't know where I was going from there. But anyway, I, I've been around passion for a long time. I've been a pastor for uh, 15 plus years. We have three gatherings uh, normally every single Sunday. I was just at Passion Camp. We had seven sessions. I was in every single one. Typically, I'm on, a, on the first few rows. This, this opportunity to gather with God's people, to give, to worship, to pray together. The, I love it. It's, it. Jesus saying, don't do it, but he's saying, do it from the right reason. And, and even me, I've got to check my heart. I have to guard myself from not coming in as the leader, going, been there, done that. I know this song, just gonna sing it because this is my job, I have to sing. Or I'm gonna lift my hands, God, because I want everybody to know that I'm like here to set the tone and like worship you and they'll lift their hands and they'll worship. No, I gotta come in and go, God, it's 
especially in the third gathering. We've already had one, by the way, a bunch of door holders were here. We still, uh, uh, God's not pleased that I'm sitting in my seat. God's pleased when my heart is aimed towards him. And it's up to me to beware, to guard myself. Be like, am I, am I, activity is not bad. We're, we're, we gotta work. We gotta raise our voice. We gotta give to the needy. We gotta speak up. We gotta do good. We need to pray. But do it for the right reasons. There is a reward from our Father when He sees us. As much as I, I've tried, I, I don't know about you, um, it makes me think about recess when I was in elementary school. And um, I don't know, like somewhere around third or fourth grade, it shifted. Re recess became, it was like just a way to get out of the classroom, have fun with my friends, play a little football or soccer. But somewhere around third or fourth grade, it shifted to what are the ladies gonna think of my game? Like the whole time, I didn't care so much about the game. I just cared if I was gonna catch the pass and look over and see that cute girl going, oh yeah, that guy. Get that 80 pound specimen in my life, you know, like... Hope oh, she's gonna be whispering to her friends, he's so cute. I hope he'll write me a letter that says check yes or no. You know, like the, the whole thing was about wanting to be seen. And, and my whole life, it's a tension that I can't get rid of until I realized also we, we're not supposed to get rid of it. This desire to be seen for our lives is been put in us by God himself, but it's not a desire to be seen by each other. It's this desire that's only filled when we realize God sees. God sees. Not only does he see the action, but he sees my heart. And what blesses him? Uh, for without faith, it's impossible to please God. So if you wanna please God, you must believe he exists and he, he rewards those, check this out, Hebrews 6, uh, 11, verse six, he rewards those who earnestly seek him. There is a reward. God sees, but he sees the heart, not just the action. So we need to check ourselves. When it comes to giving, he says, what's the left hand? Don't let the left hand know what the right hand's doing. He says, don't give to make yourself feel better. Give to honor God. And don't give for the recognition so they blow the trumpets. No, give to honor God and to help other people. Now let's keep going. Let's switch to prayer. Verse five. And when, maybe that's enough for you right there today. Your tune up, your oil change, your, your checkup. Like Ben going to the dentist. He should have gone and he might not have had an emergency root canal. He needed a checkup. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. Jesus starts teaching about prayer. Many in the people of culture, they were learning their way of prayer from the religious leaders who he referred to as hypocrites. Hypocrites, this word is about Greek actors who would put on a mask to pretend that they were somebody that they weren't. He said, when you pray, don't learn prayer from them. Made me think about how I used to learn how to pray. I, I never quite learned kind of in the private life that we'll talk about in the moment. I learned how to pray in the youth group. Anybody learn how to pray in the youth group? That was always a fun way to pray. Um, one, it was, uh, you, you have the prayer request time, and then if, if or you, take, you go around the circle, and then you all take turns praying, but in our youth group, if you didn't feel like praying, if you were nervous, you squeezed the hand of the person next to you. Did y'all ever pray that way? And then it just like went on, and so it was like, at least I'm not trying to be seen, I'm just like, and then people that never wanted to pray, they're like squeezing your hand so hard, you're like, do not make me pray. But my favorite my favorite was the unspoken. Anybody grow up in the unspoken culture? It came time for the prayer request or just me and you're like, uh, somebody had like a sin that they wanted to talk about that they needed help with and old boy would be like, hey, I got an unspoken. And we're like, we know you're dealing with lust again, bro. Just move on, you know? It's like this, this prayer culture that I grew up with and Jesus saying, hey, you're learning to pray from the wrong people. 
You're learning from hypocrites that are doing it for attention. They're doing it for status. They're doing it to appear like they're people of faith, but it's not coming from a place of faith. He said, don't pray that way. He said, here's how you should pray. But when, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. He says, when you pray, go into your room. Some commentators say that that room was the closet, the only private room in an otherwise one room house. That would be the most unglamorous room where the food is stored and it would be the only door that could be locked. When you pray, don't go to the street corners, go there. Another commentator that I respect says, hey, by this point in time, the, the word that they were using for room just actually was referring to bedroom. What's well, a bedroom with a husband and wife? It's a place of intimacy that does not get shared with other people. He said, go to that place. Either way, the closet that can be locked or the, be the bedroom between a husband and wife, both are the secret place. Both are a private place. Both are a moment with just you and God where you can commune, when you can have time with, when you can pour out your heart, when you can receive from the King. This is the invitation of prayer, but yet me and so many of you are like, 7 a.m., I gotta wake up and check off prayer because that's what Christians do. He's like, no, 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 you're missing the point. When you pray, Go to the secret place. You and I, we, we, we need the secret place. It, it's the image of the iceberg, right? What's seen above water is supported by a much greater mass below water. So if you wanna have a productive, long lasting, significant, influential, not famous, but significant life, then what's underneath the ground that people don't see needs to be weightier and bigger than what people do see. How's your prayer life? Simple old school question, how's your quiet time? Is there the, the secret place? This is where my challenge is because if you, if you re read about Jesus's life, he often drew away. Even Jesus himself needed moments when it was just him and God. But when I, when I get up, where I have my moment. One, I I, sometimes I'm reading the Bible on my phone, which is, it's lethal for me to have a quiet time on my phone. I know I'm, I, I love trying to bring my physical copy of scripture around. I love that I can have the Bible anytime I want. But when I take my phone, I'm ringing off that. It's so quick to like move on over to Instagram for a few moments or move over for me to ESPN.com texags.com, if you're an Aggie, you know, or Wall Street Journal. I know, pastor reads Wall Street Journal, don't freak out. But so, so many of the things like can quickly steal my attention when God's inviting me to this moment. It's just me and him to speak, to receive. It's, it, it's like what Jesus did. Let me turn to it so we can all see in Mark chapter one. Verse 35, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone is looking for you. They're like, what are you doing, Jesus? You gotta heal a bunch of people. You gotta teach a bunch of people. You got a big life, it's time to roll. And he was like, no, I gotta find moments. This isn't saying it always has to be in the morning. Any morning people in here? Okay, none, you're not gonna do much in life. Any late night, like burning the midnight oil people in here, my people? Okay, come on, we're, we're not getting stuff done, but we're having more fun. Can I get an amen? It, it doesn't, it, it's not a rule that you have to follow. It just has to be a moment that's undistracted. And even Jesus, he went off to the solitary place where no one could find him. And I felt that this year. Like I felt like as a parent of a six and a four-year-old, good night. It's 
hard for me to have moments in my house of peace and quiet. They get up early looking for me. They let their mom sleep, but with dad, it's time to wrestle from the get-go. But also leading a church this year, I mean, ministry doesn't sleep. There are needs, there are things, there are people. We're getting the church back gathered, moving forward, you know, pushing and making a place for more people to come in. There is a lot to do. It's not woe is me. It's just that if I want to make it, if I want to stay, sustain, I have to get moments where even though there's stuff to do, and I know I'm talking to a bunch of busy DC people. I gotta find time where it's just me and God, where I receive. And then come on, in this unsteady world, I mean, going back to the iceberg image that we've all seen, I mean, above water, things are chaotic, unsteady, shaky. But when we pray, we're tapping in, we're we're building our lives on the unchanging one. In this unsteady world, we're going to the steady one, having time with him. And so as the waves come and crashing down, we, t- we tap into the anchor of our soul. Why aren't we taking Jesus up on this invitation to draw near to him? That's all about why we pray. Let's get to uh, the last little bit. We don't have time to break all this down. But it says, this then is how you should pray. The Lord's Prayer. Anybody grow up reciting this? So powerful, very, very famous. I'm still trying to teach our kids how to pray, by the way. I need to learn uh, to make it more of a priority. But man, if you came to dinner time at the Jones household, you, should wonder, you would wonder if I should be a pastor. Like I cannot get the kids to pray. For all you single or you know, like, people without kids in here, it's like, just good luck. Call me in 10 years, five years, however long. Like, it's impossible to get my son to pray without like fully negotiating. Like, hey, we're not wrestling until you pray. We're not having uh, candy until you pray. It was like, and I don't think his heart's right yet, but at least he is learning to pray. He heard this message from afar this morning. So maybe God did something in his heart and this, tonight I'll get back and he'll be like, daddy, let's pray. But I don't count on it. <laughs> but Jesus is giving you and me a model. Not a, not a script, there's nothing wrong. It, there is power coming together and occasionally reciting the Lord's Prayer. Then it always gets to that part where you memorize different translations and you're, like, you're always like off script or not on script, right? There's, there's nothing wrong with it, but, but this, isn't a mo- this is a model, not a script. And I wanna give you a few practical pointers. We could break, break all of them down and we actually have in a series before, but just as a little tune-up, I wanna go through the Lord's Prayer. And it says, this, this, this then is how you should pray. Our Father. That's where it starts. Our Father. And it's remembering that prayer is essential to cultivating our relationship with our Heavenly Father. All relationships require cultivating time together. And most of it is, what, quality time, not quantity of time. Last I checked, uh, quantity of time was not anyone's love language. But the offer is quality from the heart, right? And, And it takes cultivation. It takes effort. It takes time. Some of you are like, I don't pray because I get distracted within three seconds. And so I'm like, this is pointless, We'll start with three seconds and next time you can make it to four seconds. It's cultivating. When me and Brittany started dating, we weren't ready to get married. Because you're only crazy if you get married after the first date. You gotta figure some things out, right? Her version of the story is that I was ready to get married because I asked her, apparently on the second date, I asked her for date two and three. She was like, whoa, slow down, bro. My version, she's not here, so I'm gonna tell you my version is that I asked her out on apparently date two or three, I'll give her that. She called back to tell me that she needed to push the brakes because she had just broken up a month or two ago with another guy named Brad and she was getting us confused. <laughs> now she, she said, I need to push the brakes because I could really see this going somewhere. And I was like, you told me you wanted to have my kids. That's what you just told me. <laughs> Don't tell her I said that. 
But it, our relationship, even though we are into each other, it, it takes cultivation. It takes time, quality time, and it still takes cultivation. Our relationship would not be strong if we just worked our calendar together and disciplined our kids together. But we need time, me and her, to cultivate that relationship. You need, you want to know God? You want to walk with God? It is simple, but how bad do you want it? And if we're honest, let's check our priorities. Because you might want that promotion on, on your job or that date with that guy or that time with some substance helping you out more than you want a relationship with God. But the king of the universe is saying, come and commune with me. Come and sit with me. Come and receive from me. I made you. I know what you need. I know better than, about you than you do. And it's an invitation saying, come and sit. But yet, if you look at our lives, so many of us are, are saying, no, thanks, God. We're good. But it's essential to cultivating. It's a natural activity of, of building our relationship with God. Number two, it says in the prayer, our Father in heaven, hallowed. What does that even mean, hallowed? Am I supposed to start my prayer with a bunch of words? I don't even know what they say. No, it, it says start your prayer with praise and not a list. Prayer needs to start with praise before it goes to a list. Notice in the Lord's prayer, the first three, uh, the first three movements or the first three things that are mentioned are all vertical. The first three petitions. They're, they're, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. It's vertical. I'm coming to prayer, I'm coming to commune and my eyes aren't on the stuff, aren't on me, aren't on things. My eyes, I'm trying to lift my gaze to you. Prayer is praise. And so maybe sometimes you're like, I, I don't have the praise. And I appreciate what Brennan was saying earlier. That's legit. You don't need to come and fake it with God because he sees. You need to come and be honest. But in the moments that I've been honest with God, I'm struggling, I'm wrestling. Typically, I'll get led to a psalm. It's just like many of the psalms that start with anguish, pain, frustration. They end up, because as our gaze gets lifted, we can't help but worship. So come, and come to prayer, not to get what you want, but to get your eyes on what you need. And that is Jesus. And sometimes you're like, I, Brad, Hallowed doesn't make sense. I don't even know what to say. That's why I'm like, thank you, God, for being God. And that's okay. Because God cares more about your heart than even your words. But put some music on, some worship music, and that'll begin to fill your heart. Start reading the scripture, and that'll... Say scripture to God, God, uh, before you, all things were... You know, you created all things by him and for him, all things were created. There is no one like you. Romans 11, a, bit, a beautiful benediction. Just start saying scripture and it gets in your mind. It'll eventually get in your heart because worship, our prayer is first praise. It's first worship. Then it is list. Our Father, hallowed, set apart. There's no one like you. May your name be set apart in the world and in my life. The last vertical petition, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's a scary prayer. Your kingdom come, your will. God, God, I thought prayer was about coming with my will, what I need. You're saying, start saying your will. Yeah, prayer is point number three, is about aligning our hearts with God's heart. Prayer is about aligning our heart with God's heart. His ways, scripture says, are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. He sees the beginning from the end. He knows us inside and out. Like he said, Jesus said earlier, he knows what we need before we even ask him. So let's come and instead of saying, God, this is what we need. He's like, God, you, you're in heaven. We're on earth. I'm gonna let my words be few. I'm not gonna babble like the pagans. I'm gonna say, God, 
May your heart become my heart. I'm here to align. So it seems like to me, so many of us also go with, into this prayer to get content for our social media. Because we don't, we, we, we go, oh, God gave me a verse. God gave me a word. I got to immediately go tell that to the world. No, in the secret place, some things need to stay there. It's just between you and God. I'll try to move quickly. Give us today our daily bread. Prayer is proof of our dependence on God. If you're wondering whose strength you're depending on, what's the operating flow of your life? If you're truly walking with God, then the gut check, and I'm saying this to myself, I promise you that we need to evaluate, be, beware, think about our prayer life. Because if we're not asking God for help, are we really truly relying on his help? Thinking we need his help? And, and he's there not to say, hey, go do it on your own. No, he's there and his Holy Spirit said, I wanna help you. I wanna strengthen you. I wanna empower you. I wanna, my grace is sufficient for you. And he just loves when he come and ask him. He, he loves it. He's not mad that we don't get all the words right. He's like, oh, that's my boy. That's my girl. Yeah, she's learning. She doesn't get it all. She's not even sure what to ask all the time, but the Holy Spirit's in her saying, hey, you know, interceding on her behalf. I'm so glad they're drawing near to me. I'm so glad they're spending time with me. The other day I asked Caleb to say something nice to his mom. He wouldn't say it. He's a bad parent. I was like, I'm gonna give you some candy if you say it. And he's like, mom, you look really pretty today. His heart wasn't right. God's like, no, come with a pure heart in faith and depend on me and I will give you a scripture that says grace and mercy in your time of need. I love, it says give us today. So yes, come, come with your request. It talk, Jesus talked later in scripture about a guy that kept going to knock on the door late into the night just begging God for help. I'm not here to tell you not to do that because God's welcoming that. Just keep asking, keep knocking. Keep going to him. He might not always answer it. And sometimes that's a good thing. Even if it's not a good thing and it's a hard thing, just trust he knows what he's doing and he loves you deeply. So I'm not telling you not to go with your request. But, but so much of it, that's what prayer has become. And it says, give us today. So go with requests for your own life, but also go with requests to your friends' lives, to your neighbors' lives. Give them today their daily bread. Give them what they need. Give them revelation. Give them encouragement. Give them friendship. Give them provision. Give them a job. Because typically when I found that I'm only praying for myself, then it's again just a big wish list I'm trying to send up to heaven. Pray, I mean, pray for John. Pray for Maddie. Pray for Rick and Caitlin. Pray for Clay. I mean, as you meet people in the church, that is the beauty of the gift of each other. We know what we're going through. We say, give us, give us. Pray for this church. I mean, if Ben and Donna and the staff team are the, are the only ones praying for this church, you think we're, we're ever gonna be the city on the hill that this city really needs? Give us today provision, more people, more, more people aligned with our heart, more door holders to step into the story, more provision through the giving so we could not have all these venue issues or get a new AC in this place. Like, let's, let's pray. We need your help, God. We're depending on you. Let's, let's let our prayers be proof that we're depending on God and not operating in our own strength. And forgive us our debts. I don't have a lot of time for this, but I wanna say it. For, forgive us our debts as we are also or have also forgiven our debtors. Point number five. Prayer has the power to change the relationships that hurt us the most. I wish I could really break that down. But my guess is some of what you're struggling with is internally choices that you've made or peace that you're longing for. That, that's a, a giant struggle right now, anxiety and, and depression and insecurity plaguing us, partly because we're not lifting our gaze. 
But another thing that's plaguing us is what's been wronged, like who has wronged us. It's called bitterness. It's called anger. It's called rage. And if, if the wrong person says the wrong thing at the wrong time, you could, you're just one second from flying off the handle because you've been hurt. You've been injured. You've been wronged. You've been passed over. And, and you're carrying around bitterness. You know, how do I deal with this bitterness? Well, there's a lot of different ways, but one of those is found through prayer. Because when you, when you go to God and say, God, forgive us, you're getting in touch with the fact that He has forgiven you. That you were dead in your transgressions and sins. This is the gospel that you did turn your back on God, that you were by nature objects of wrath. But yet the God of the universe who created you, made you, formed you, loved you, sent his one and only son to do for you what you can never do for yourself. And that is recognizing the grace, recognizing the forgiveness that yes, everything we do is filthy rags. I've sinned, I've fallen short. I've never measured up. I keep turning my back. But you keep extending grace. So when we come and we're like, God, forgive me. I find it helpful to acknowledge specifically. Some call it confession. I think it's better to be seen as agreement. God, I'm, a, I'm agreeing with you. I'm recognizing, admitting to you what you already know about me. That I've sinned. That I've fallen short. That today, here's a few specific things. God's not like, oh my goodness, thank you for telling me that. If you wouldn't have told me, I would have but to never know. No, but he, he knows it's helpful. Blessed are the poor in spirit. He, he knows it's helpful for us to acknowledge our need. And as we receive grace, then we have the power to extend grace. Some of the stuff that's play, holding you back and keeping you bondage to things of your past is petty. But some of it's big. And, and, and you're, you're missing out even though they've moved on. And the key to unlocking your freedom is receiving grace and then extending grace. And that comes through prayer. Lastly, it says the prayer is lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And I just want to remind you again today as I try to compel myself, remind myself and you towards a, a yes, corporate gatherings, but private moments with Jesus, God rewards your prayers. It might not always make sense. It's mysterious. It requires faith. You're not sure like how he hears but he does and he sees and he celebrates, he rewards it. You know what the reward is? It says, deliver us from the evil one. Lead us not into temptation. That word deliver is not just deliver from something, but it's delivering to something. Or it says, deliver us from the evil one at the same time and deliver us to yourself. So what's the reward of prayer? Yes. Uh, and what's the reward of giving? And what's the reward of fasting? In heaven, we will be rewarded for our time on earth. Treasures in heaven will lay our crowns at the feet. But the reward of prayer here and forever is Jesus. It's the king. It's not the kingdom. It's the king. It's not the gifts. It's the giver of the gifts. So when we come to prayer looking for a reward, what's the reward? Just time just time. Man, it, 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 if I tell Brittany that I, I'm not kidding, if I tell Brittany I'm going to take her on a date, it doesn't matter how expensive it is. It doesn't matter like what we're doing. I just see a smile go on her face. Hey, I, I want time with you. And, and God, man, he, when we want time with him, he gives of himself. He shows us who he is. And he rewards that 
prayer and he, and he delivers us not just to himself, but he delivers us from the lesser things of life and he delivers us to the greater things in life. The, e- the evil one wants to still kill and destroy, but he's trying to save us. The world's trying to tell us we're missing out, but it's like, no, he's trying to save us from the less and deliver us to the more. He doesn't want you living for the wrong things, the temporary things, the unsatisfying thing, the shaky things. He's trying, through prayer, he's trying to deliver you into the very best. And so as we close, I just want to tell one last scripture and story. Earlier this year, I felt like God, I'm not a big verse of the year guy, but I want to be. I just haven't always done it, but I felt like God was inviting me to uh, a journey this year. And he kept anchoring me back to Psalm 84, verse five and six. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on a pilgrimage. Blessed are you, are those whose strength is found in coming to God, whose hearts not just the words, not just the activity, not just the hands raised, not just the religious, you know, going through the motions, no, whose hearts are set. Set your heart, not on getting the job or getting the girl or getting the guy or whatever, whatever, getting the family. Set your hearts on a pilgrimage. And as they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. This would be talking about maybe when they're not sure exactly where the Valley of Baca was, but as people were journeying to Jerusalem, this would be the pilgrimage to meet with God, to offer their sacrifice. They would go through these valleys where there would be no water, no sustenance. Baca means weariness. As we travel through places of weariness, sound familiar? Anybody in here been through a weary year? An exhausting year? And it's not just about your year, it's about our year. We've all gone through it. But it says there's something different about the Jesus people whose hearts are set on a pilgrimage. Because when we do that, we make those dry places, places of springs where water can be found, where sustenance could be drank of. They would either um, dig holes down deep to find the water. Sound like Jesus? Hey, I gotta dig past the things of the world, but I'm gonna get down to the bedrock. Or they would dig up holes and then wait for the rain to come. And it wouldn't just be water to satisfy them. It would be for some other people. You, You work in a hurting world. You go to school in a hurting world. We've all been on common ground more than ever before. We are weary. In DC, last night, another shooting. We are weary, God. But it's time for the Jesus people. The people of Passion City, DC. To have their heart set on a pilgrimage meeting with the King of King, not for what we can get, but because of who he is. And as we do that, yes, we'll still be going through weariness and dry land and hardship. But when, we, when, we're, when our hearts are set, we can find the place of springs that gives life and sustenance and fuel to our souls but to the souls of those who are around us, that's the reward and the promise of a prayer. It's about sitting with and communing with the King.